Hi, Chef. Is that you say Mahin? Yeah, Mahin. Mahin. Hi, Chef. That's pretty. How you doing? Chef, I'm doing good. How are you? Oh, okay. I actually made the dumpling mixture yesterday for my own mushroom and chicken dumpling, and I was going to fold it today. Cool. That's well, I made the... Uh, let's see. I made, I made, you know, a test batch, of course, yesterday for this. Mm -hmm. and it was like, really good. I like, uh, you know, I like them all different ways. And of course, you can make them with <laughs> shrimp or chicken or turkey or vegetables or tofu or, you know, or, 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 <clears throat> or bacon. You know. Bacon and dumpling. I've never heard of that. That yeah. sounds good. There but it does, yeah. That you could actually but it doesn't actually fit into the Korean part of it, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> trying to at least stay somewhat culturally relevant with this one. Here comes up Jack. We have a lot of people coming in today. This is really exciting. Excellent. I know there's lots of dumpling fans out there, so oh, definitely it, you have yeah. a hot topic. Yeah. Well, that's a it's a great topic. You know. <laughs> John just said, I can't smell anything yet. We're really working hard on getting the smell -o vision part of the taste box up and running, but we just have not had a very, very successful trial yet. <laughs> that's okay. That's a, that's a, we'll there. a bottom. <laughs> All right. So, oh, those look nice. What was that? Hold on. Yeah. That, what do you have? What do you have behind you there, Don? Well, not that. <laughs> I was looking at the bakery. That looked very nice. Those were those were very nice. So, all right, folks, please um, please keep your mics on mute during the taste talks so that um, Chef will stay the prevalent video. Um, we are going to go ahead and get started. So if this is your first time to a taste talk, welcome. Very excited to see you here. And I see lots of um, familiar faces as well. So my name is Christine Duke. I'm the continuing education program manager at Kendall College at National Lewis University. And I created the taste talks as a way for um, us to kind of get a little bit of education, a little bit of entertainment, and a way for us to actually connect and engage with each other uh, during these times. But I know a lot of you are at home um, cooking right now, and it's not necessarily uh, the place that you're usually creating, making, or eating all of your food. So wanted to have our, staff, our faculty come and share a little bit of their knowledge with everyone so that everyone gets a chance to um, learn some new skills, try some new things in the kitchen. And today I'm very excited for Chef Chris Quirk to be back with us again. Uh, he is going to be teaching us uh, Korean kimchi manju dumplings. And just a reminder during the talk, please keep your microphone muted. And if you have any questions at all, please put them in the chat and I will be asking them for Chef. So Chef, please, we are very excited mm -hmm. to get started. All right. We're live? We're live. We're good. Let's go. We're live. Okay. All right. Well, good morning. Um, so I'm Chef Quirk. Some of you have seen me uh, the last time when I was doing pantry sushi, perhaps, which was a, a fun little exercise. Uh, Christine had asked if maybe we could do some dumplings. And since I'm a particularly big fan of dumplings, a big fan, 
<laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> I thought we would make uh, Korean kimchi dumplings. You know, I make dumplings of sort of a lot of different shapes and sizes. Uh, my kids make dumplings with me. My students make dumplings with me. It's it's just one of those things. You know, who doesn't love dumplings? And the thing about dumplings is dumplings can be, you know, they're they're like chameleons. You know, it looks the same on the outside, but it could be a really surprising inside, right? We, we make dumplings with. Um, actually, I made a kimchi, a kimchi and oyster dumpling. You know, fresh oysters, just lightly chopped, and then mixed with the kimchi and put in the dumpling. And that was that was terrific. Serve that in a, a little shooter with some uh, some of the oyster liquor and some uh, some dashi stock, right? So just a quick little a quick little one in, and they they were delicious. Now of course I don't have access to fresh oysters today, but you know if we did we could do that. So I'm going to do sort of a more standard uh, kimchi mandu. Um, so mandu is just dumplings. These are like steamed dumplings or fried dumplings. Uh, and if any of you are familiar with the Jungbu Market, which is just off of uh, 9094 on the west side of Chicago, great place to go for Korean ingredients. But they also have a dumpling window, and they serve uh, what's called Wan Mandu, which are really large, or King Mandu, right? Really large uh, dumplings. They're almost, it looks more like a, like a steamed bun. Right, but filled with uh, kimchi and pork and noodles, just absolutely delicious. Um, however, that's way out on the west side, and it's kind of hard for me to get there on a regular basis, so I don't. Um, and I'm stuck inside like the rest of you, so I thought maybe we would try something that we could do easily inside. Now, this is part of why I've decided to go ahead and show you making the dumpling wrappers from scratch, okay? I mean, not everybody wants to make dumpling wrappers from scratch. It's a bit of work. Uh, I personally think that making them from scratch gives you a better wrapper. Um, they hold up better. They're more malleable. Uh, they're less likely to crack. And I've got a package of commercial dumpling wrappers here. Uh, I keep these around when the kids just want to want to quick to make some pot stickers. You know, I pull these out, make a little filling, put them together. No problems, right? Um, nice thing about the commercial wrappers is they're not too expensive. They're easy to find. You can get them in almost any grocery store. Um, <laughs> they're even thickness, evenly sized. You want to make a bunch of dumplings. It's a pretty easy thing, right? However, if you want to have something that's a little bit more personal, and again, you can size these any way you like, right? So we're going to make the dumplings just a little larger than you would get with this. So this is about um, three and a half inch across. The dumplings I'm going to make, uh, the dough is probably closer to four inches. So it's going to make a slightly larger dumpling, which is kind of what I like. Easier to handle as well. Easier to stuff. And less likely to crack, right? The, the problem with these dumplings is that they're not really fresh. If these wrappers aren't really fresh, they don't have much stretch. They don't have much give. And so if you want to pull the dumpling back around, like I'm going to show you today, to make this sort of classic mandu style, they have a tendency to break. So we're just gonna, we're gonna go with the homemade ones today. Okay. Plus it's more fun that way. All right, so for any of you who've done dumpling uh, dough at home, there's two ways basically to go about it um, that I've used. One is the cold method, right? So it's just flour, cold water, a little bit of salt, put them together, you, you make a, you know, you knead it into a dough, develop it nicely, let it rest so that you can roll it out without having it spring back really easily, right? But then there's sort of type two, right? And that's what I'm gonna show you today. So this is a boiling water dough, okay? So the recipe I'm using today calls for two cups of flour. I'm using this basic AP flour. One cup, I may have lost a little bit of my water here. One cup of boiling water, okay? So just add a boil. So I'm going to go ahead and just pour that right into my flour, right into the well. Okay, stir that in. Okay, now that, what happens with the, yeah, I lost a little bit too much, but I have a little bit more back here. I had it on a little bit early, so I'm going to add just a smidge more. What happens when you add the boiling water is you pre-gelatinizing some of the starch in the dough. It makes the dough very malleable. It makes it really easy to work. Now here's another little uh, another little tidbit. 
if you're uh, if you want to get a really nice soft bread that has good keeping abilities, okay, using pre, pre the pre gelatinized uh, starch method works really well with that. Although you have to pre gelatinize some of your flour and water together, then add it into your bread because you don't want to put it in hot; it would kill your yeast. This it doesn't matter because we're using we're making a dead dough anyway. Okay, so I've got some of that in there. Then we're going to just dump the the lumps out on the board. Okay, so I get this stuff out here. Now careful, because this stuff's still a little bit hot, right? Then I'm gonna go ahead and knead my dough. I'm hoping you can all see this. And yeah, it's it's warm. So we'll work with it kind of quickly. And it kneads so easily when you've got the hot water in there. You also, if you're making, um, if you're working with uh, sweet rice, uh, or mochi, uh, making mochi dumplings. You also want to use the uh, boiling water method, so you pre-gelatinize some of the, the mochi or the mochi flour, right? And then you add a little bit, you add enough flour into it to get the dough to the consistency you want, right? Keep my, keep my little scraper handy. Okay. A little bit more, it's still a little bit wet. You don't want sticky, you want smooth, right? But it goes pretty quick. And you can see that the dough, I don't know if you can see this at all, but as I'm pushing the dough, instead of instead of coming back around a little ball, like when you're kneading uh, bread dough, it pushes out almost flat, like a plaque, right? So it kneads a little bit differently once you're using the hot water as well. Okay, so we're just gonna get a quick knead on this. Coming off my base here. Okay, this actually feels pretty good. Put that back out of the way. Gather up any flour that I missed. Turn my uh, cooking water back down a little bit. Okay. So now once I get the dough nice and smooth, and already this dough feels really good, right? It's it's such a fast dough to make, right? Because remember, you don't want this, you don't want to really develop the gluten in this too much because then it's gonna, you're gonna have to let it sit for a couple of hours for it to be to be to be able to roll nice and easy. Otherwise, as you're rolling it, it's just gonna keep snapping back, right? So, so I got a nice uh, nice piece of dough. Going to coat it with a little cornstarch. Okay, cornstarch doesn't absorb water until you heat it, right? Wheat flour, of course, will absorb water because it contains proteins, right? The starch doesn't absorb the water; the proteins do, and so you end up with sticky. And this is going to get a little bit of sticky as you're letting it rest. So if you coat it with a little cornstarch, or once you have it rolled. Once you roll your dumpling skins, if you want to keep them from sticking together, a little cornstarch instead of flour will keep it from sticking together for hours, days, right? You can freeze it, come back to it another time, okay? So cornstarch is a great thing. Okay, so I'm going to just take my dough, put it in my resting box. And that can wait until I'm ready, right? So now that's going to need to rest for at least a couple of hours. So what we're going to do now is use a little bit of the magic of uh, Zoom, Zoom Vision. Zoom, Zoom TV. <laughs> okay. So now I made a batch yesterday, right? So it's beautiful dough, right? Not not too sticky, but it's it rolls super easy, right? It's it's nice and relaxed, right? It's like a nice uh, sunny day outside with a cold beer, you know, sitting in your chair, relaxed. You know what I'm saying? So now we're gonna just take a little, I cut these uh, into one ounce, one ounce pieces, okay? I'm going to uh, roll them pretty thin. Now, if you can see my board here, this is one of these great little uh, bamboo boards. It's a uh, stripe, light and dark. So what I'd like to do is get the dough thin enough where I can see 
not read, but I can see the uh, the stripes, the light and dark stripes through the dough a little bit, okay? Because that means then the dough is going to be thin enough. <clears throat> now I have a basic rolling pin. This is a, this is a tapered pin. If you're doing something that you like to make super thin, a tapered pin makes life a little bit easier, right? The bigger the the bigger the you know the bigger the flat edge on this thing, it tends to make the dough come out in uneven uneven edges. I think so. I keep a tapered pin around for just such an emergency. But if you're patient with it, you can use basically any rolling pin. It doesn't matter. Okay. So a little bit of flour on the board. Start out. Roll it once. Turn it half. Right. Turn it over and flip it halfway around. Okay. Make sure you got enough flour. See, it's pretty round. All right. Do that again. One more go. And one last one. There we go. Right? Very nice. So you compare this to my standard size uh, dumplings, right? About a third larger. That's a nice size. So I'm just going to put that aside. Let's roll a couple more. And then I have some that I pre rolled, so that's going to move us along a little bit. Now I like to make the dough first. Um, usually I make the dumpling filling next. And while I'm making the filling, the dough is resting. It doesn't have to be chilled. It just has to be resting. Okay, because I worked with it yesterday. I worked with it, it was still room temperature, it was perfect, all right? So it's not like a pastry dough. You're not worried about the fat in it. You're just worried about the dough relaxing. All right. So let's roll this one out a little bit. Now I can just make out the stripes, the colored stripes through the dough here. So that's kind of what you're looking for. Not not like paper thin, but pretty thin. A little bit more flour. You don't want to use a ton of flour, but you need to have enough to keep things from sticking, right? Otherwise, you can see it'll roll up on. I've got a little sticky spot there. It's going to just roll up on the thing. Don't worry about it. What's the worst that's going to happen? You get one that's slightly out of shape. But you can adjust for that when you're actually doing the uh, when you're doing the stuffing, okay? There we go. Okay, nice. So now I'm going to put these aside. Okay. Next, I'm going to flip my board. Okay. This is going to take us a little bit less time. So now, the filling. Let's talk about the filling for just a second. Okay, the filling needs to be pretty finely cut. If you don't have, if you have big pieces of anything in there, there's a good chance that those are going to push through the dough when you're making the dumpling, right? So you want to have things cut pretty evenly and pretty small, right? From there, what you put inside the dumpling is going to be kind of up to you. Right? This is a basic pork. I uh, got some pork butt. Kimchi, yeah, got some kimchi. And in this case, I'm using uh, I'm using chives from the garden, right? You can use scallions or substitute something else. You can also use seafood. Shrimp makes a really great dumpling. Calamari makes a really great dumpling. Finely chopped calamari. Oh yeah, I've done it with scallops. I mentioned doing it with oysters, right? There's all kinds of things you can use for your protein. If you don't want to put a meat protein in, don't. Right? You can use tofu, right? You can use regular, you can use regular firm tofu. Make sure you drain it well, right? Because part of the, the thing you want to avoid is a really, really wet stuffing. Okay. But you can use tofu, you can use tempeh, you can use whatever you like, right? Then on top of that, vegetables, mushrooms, no problem. Scallions are great. Um, Gosh, uh, small, very small diced uh, sweet potato is really good in there. Um, also, if you want to put some noodles in there, it's really common in Korean dumplings to find noodles. So usually use yam starch noodles or you can use glass noodles. 
Once they're cooked though, then they have to be chopped smaller. You can't just put the long noodles in there, it won't work. But a little bit of noodles in there, that's really great. Seasoning, well, salt is a great idea. Okay, start with a little bit of salt. If you'd rather use soy sauce, that's fine. Touch of uh, sesame oil, really common in Korean dumplings. Okay, oyster sauce, there's another one, right? Really common in Korean dumplings. There's a lot of different things you can use. Now, I'm not gonna add a lot of salt to this. In fact, I'm actually not gonna add any additional salt because the kimchi that I have, and this is homemade kimchi, so um, my kimchi tends to be a little bit on the salty side. I think I use about a 2% salt uh, salt ratio in my kimchi. So it comes out just a little bit on the salty side, but I'm using it mostly for, for condiments anyway, right? But I'm, I always get a little wiggy about going less than that in terms of uh, in terms of getting the right ferments in my kimchi. So uh, anyway, basic cabbage kimchi, right? Kind of hot, kind of funky. And I can tell you another thing is, is that if you've got old kimchi that's been sitting in the back of your fridge for the last six months, because they weren't quite sure what to do with it, that's going to be even better, right? Old kimchi works better for cooking, right? Nice fresh kimchi, little bowl of rice, that's great. Young kimchi, right? Really great to be eaten fresh like that. But if you're going to eat, if you're going to eat it cooked, old kimchi makes more sense, right? Because it adds a lot more flavor. It's more sour, right? It gives you some really intense taste. Okay, so now I'm going to combine all my ingredients. So I still have to chop my pork, so you're gonna see me do that by hand. But let me, uh, I've, already, I've already squeezed out my kimchi and chopped it somewhat fine. So you can see, I'm gonna come up here to the camera. Okay, a little handful of kimchi right there. I'm dropping it on my keyboard. <laughs> okay, so nicely chopped, okay? Look at that nibble. Next, we're going to use, uh, we're going to chop up our scallions, or our, in this case, our chives. Okay, so move that to the side there. Okay, going to cut these guys about a quarter inch. Do my little yam can cook uh, imitation here. If pork can cook, so can you, right? <laughs> I love that show. That was one of my favorite shows of all time, especially with like the dancing chickens, right? My God, that guy was hysterical. And he, I, I met him a couple of times over the years. And he's he's like the nicest guy you ever met. I, I've heard that about him. My my husband really liked his show too when he was a kid. So. All right, so I'm gonna go in with my chives, right? Into my, now, the kimchi already has some scallions in it, right? But this is going to add a little bit more. I like that. So next, I'm going to turn on my pork. You don't want to use, you don't want the pork to be trimmed, okay? If you trim the pork, you lose the fat. The fat really makes the dumplings sink, okay? So you want to have, if you have pork belly, right, that's great. Uh, in this case, it just be, it just be, it just happens to be what I have in the house, okay? So now I just I just sliced it a little bit. Now, good thing you're muted. I don't know. Hey Jeff, I can't hear anything. If you have a meat grinder, you can just run it through that. If you're gonna put it in your Robocoop, right, so you don't you don't make it into a paste, right? You're gonna have to cut it in small pieces. If you put it in the freezer for a couple of minutes, well, okay, for a half an hour, after you cut it in small pieces, it'll cut up in your Robocoop nice and easy. Um, I just kind of like, I find that this is very um, therapeutic, right? Hung on the board with my knife. You keep your fingers away from the knife, right? Okay. Nice to chop meat. Okay. 
can add that in with my kimchi and my um, and my chives. So I just scrape the board a little bit here. that off to the side. Now just take a spoon, whatever you got, right? Let's mix all that together. Nice and easy. Okay. You want to make it, you want to make sure that the, that the kimchi and the pork are fully distributed with each other, right? You don't want lumps. Partly because the pork is going to help hold the, the dumpling together. Right now if you have really really lean pork or if you go to the grocery and you get ground pork or that's what you just happen to have right i suggest that maybe you add a little bit of egg to the mix partly because it's likely that that pork is uh, if, especially if it was frozen right it's not going to hold particularly well together and b um it's a good chance that you're looking at maybe like uh like about an 80 20 or an 85 15 ratio for lean to fat. Straight up pork, uh, pork shoulder is about 80-20, which is pretty good, right? A little bit more fat would be better, but if you might need an egg to help it kind of bind together, right? Now, I'm not putting one in here, but you can always put that in there if you like, okay? I have a couple of questions. Yes. Um, one is, could, yes. could schmaltz be used for the fat? Like if they weren't gonna be cooking yeah. pork, and then you another, can, yeah, go, right. go right ahead, go right ahead. Okay, let me, let, me, let me answer the schmaltz one. You don't want to add a lot of liquid fat to it. Schmaltz is very liquid fat, right? Chicken, chicken fat is, uh, is highly unsaturated. It's not completely unsaturated, right? So you put it in the fridge, it gets solid, right? So it means it's slightly saturated. But at room temperature, it's pretty liquid. You can put a little bit in there for mouthfeel and for flavor, right? Because schmaltz just tastes great, right? I mean, I got to say that. Um, you don't need to, if you have fatty enough, if you have fatty enough meat, you're going to use something like chicken, which doesn't have a lot of fat, especially for breast meat, then heck yeah, put a little bit of schmaltz in there. Okay. Uh, if you're going to use chicken thigh meat, which I think comes out better, it cooks better, it has a better texture, it doesn't get as dry. Um, why not though? A little bit of schmaltz? Sure. What's the next question? Sorry, go ahead. Um, what was the name of the knife that I you were using it. to cut up the pork? <laughs> was that was it a cleaver that you were using? Was it a cleaver? Yeah, I'm just using, using a Chinese yeah. cleaver. Mm -hmm. Okay, standard Chinese cleaver. Got an inch. My wife got this in Chinatown. Uh, up in Montreal, probably 20 some years ago. Um, this is a, it's carbon steel. It's not a stainless steel one. You can get them in stainless, but this is, this happens to be a carbon one, which explains some of the, the staining on it, right? Over the years. Um, but you can see it's got a slightly rounded edge. It's not completely flat, right? These things are great for all kinds of things. They get a nice edge. Carbon steel tends to hold a nice, get and hold a nice edge for this kind of work. Plus then it acts almost like the bench scraper, right? You can get underneath the food and then lift it up, carry it around, it's, it's awesome, okay? Cool, thank you. Sure. Uh, okay, now I'm gonna show you one little thing here. I'm coming back up. So now I first showed you the, the, chopped, um, the chopped kimchi. Okay, the chopped kimchi was nice. It fell apart nice and easy. This is the meat mixed with the kimchi. You see it just binds it together. There's more kimchi than meat. There's about 12 ounces of kimchi, about eight ounces of, of meat, and about an ounce of, uh, about an ounce of chives, okay? So that's, what, that's what's in here. But it's, it's makes your dumpling, it makes your dumpling assembly a little bit easier if, if the mix is holding together a little bit. It doesn't have to, it doesn't have to hold together like a ball and not come back out, right? I could pull this apart pretty easy. But if it holds together a little bit, life just becomes a little bit easier. I'm gonna change up my uh, stuff here just a little. Okay. Get any extra stuff off my board here. 
Yes, yes, I know. First cardinal rule of television, never show them your back. Well, <laughs> you just saw it. Okay, so I'll show you, we, we, did the, we did the rollout. We made the filling. Okay, so now the next fun part. Let's make a few dumplings. Okay. Got to have a landing zone. In this case, I'm just using a sheet pan with a, I've got an old, uh, an old silk pad on there, right? Keep things from sticking. Just makes life easy. I've got my pre-roll dumpling skins, okay? These are the ones that I just did a few minutes ago, plus some ones, some ones, some dumpling skins that I did earlier, right? Okay, got my skins. I'm gonna redo this so we can see. Pardon me for a second here. Okay, so you can see that pretty easy, I would think. Got a little bit of water in a bowl. You can use a brush if you need, right? Brush makes things easier for some people. I've got, uh, you know, I do this both ways. Um, I'm just going to use my fingers, so just dip them in the water a little bit, and then I'm just brushing it. Come back up here. Yeah. So I'm just brushing about half of the edge, okay? So this part's got water, this part's still dry. Next, we're going to take about a good ounce of filling, okay? You don't want to overstuff the dumplings. If you do, then you're going to have a hard time getting them closed properly, and then there's a good chance they may, oh, shoot, you lost my feed. Yeah, you froze. Good. You froze earlier, but you came right back, so. Okay, how do we fix this one? Do I have to get out and come back? Well, you can get out and come back, and that'll solve so that we can see everything. Is everyone okay with waiting for a moment? Can I see uh, hands on reactions? Everyone cool with waiting for a moment for Chef to return? Yep, yep. Okay. So okay. we'll have just a moment. Yeah, I'm just going to leave. Okay, he will return in just a moment, folks. So sorry. Zoom can be a little bit imperfect sometimes. He, he was on early preparing, so sometimes when you're on for a long time, it then um, will go to where it can freeze you. So thank you all for waiting. So what while we're waiting for Chef to return, uh, anyone already brainstorming on what kind of fillings they're thinking about maybe uh, putting in some dumplings this week? Let me know down in the chat. Let's see what uh, kind of ideas you guys might have. I was liking that bacon idea before. That sounded really good to me, but I'm like, bacon and what? Hmm, I think, I think it needs a little more. Let's see, we've got um, Maheen thinking chicken, mushroom, and cabbage. That yep, sounds yes. like a great combination right there. Ah, hi, Chef. I'm back. Okay, so now as I'm showing you, I've got, I've got my dumpling filling inside my skin. Okay, there we go. Now I'm just gonna join the edges together. This is the easy part, right? I mean, you can make nice pleats in this, but I am just going to take the edges. Now I've got a little, eh, right? Looks kind of like a pierogi. So now I'm gonna take this guy, just a touch more water on the corner there, and I'm going to, I've got the, I've got the top edges, the, the straight edge, right? And I'm going to tuck it in around my finger, join those edges. And now we've got our dumpling. Happy okay. little dumpling. Little mouth right here, right? Isn't that awesome? Okay. There we go. First dumpling. Well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, do a few more of these. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
folks, while he's assembling a couple more of these, does anyone have any questions about uh, any of the construction of the dumplings so far? Ask, ask. How many per hour can you crank out? <laughs> How many can you crank out in an hour, Chef? Me, probably about, if I've got my knees together, assuming that I've got my dough resting, I could probably make about, probably about 60 or so. I'll want a minute. I'm not super fast with this. Um, I, was, I used to work uh, with actually one of my students uh, who was, oh my gosh, he was, oops, he was so fast at making dumplings. Uh, he used to go in uh, sometimes and work with Chef Meyer, right? So he'd go in and then he'd just, he'd get a couple of the other students together and they would just crank them out, but they would do like four or 500 in a morning, right? So lots of dumplings. He was very good at that. Is there such a thing as a dessert dumpling? Say again now? Dessert dumpling? Dessert? Dessert dumpling, sure, why not? Whoops, that one got a little, uh, I pulled that one a little bit. So, uh, what kind of, um, ah, what kind of good. fillings would you recommend for that, Chef? Dessert dumplings. Uh, sweet bean for a more traditional, um, or a more traditional oriental style dumpling. So you can get sweet bean paste, um, ogura, ogura an at, uh, at pretty much any oriental grocery, right? It's very nice stuff that tastes great. It's a little on the sweet side, but then you make the dumplings and then and you think, right, keep it all sweet. But if you, if you dip your sweet dumpling in soy sauce, they're awesome, right? That sweet and salty with the umami combination. I should use a little bit more, uh, a little bit more cornstarch. All right, if you're having any sticking problems, a little cornstarch will help that along. In this case, that's what I'm going to use because. So I have another question as well. Is it easy to make homemade kimchi? Is it easy to make kimchi? Is that the question? Mm hmm. Yes. <laughs> It's super easy. And then would you so, be... There's a couple things to remember about making kimchi, okay? Because kimchi, you've got to ferment at room temperature. It's like making sauerkraut. If you do it properly, you've got, you've got a safe product to eat, right? But anytime you're doing fermentation, you've got to make sure that you're in charge of what's happening, right? And if, you, if you're not... If you're just like kind of throwing it together and hoping for the best, you can end up with some uh, some serious results in terms of bacterial infections in your kimchi, and then you eat it, and then you're going to get sick. So kimchi, like any other lacto-fermented vegetable, fermented pickles, right, naturally fermented pickles, uh, sauerkraut, kimchi, anything like that, you want to start out by making sure that anything you're working with is clean, 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 right, sanitized. Two, that the weight of salt for your vegetables is about is like between one and a half and two percent. I always go two percent. I always go a little bit higher, right? So weigh your vegetables, multiply that times, you know, see how many ounces you got, multiply that times 0.02, and you're gonna come up with how much you need, okay? Because if you don't have enough salt, there's a good possibility you're gonna have you're gonna have unwanted bacteria growing in there. So when it gets really warm, the reason that you see this sort of iconic kimchi being fermented in the ground thing is because kimchi wants to be fermenting at a, at a regular temperature. It's like, it's like sauerkraut. It's made in the fall. It's not hot. You make it in the summertime, your ferment can run away with you. You can end up with a, with a lot of the yeast growing in it. And then you also get some really off. Then you get pink slimy kimchi and it's nasty, right? So other than that, it's pretty simple. I make, uh, well, I say I make, when I was at Kendall, every quarter I would make probably about 100 pounds of kimchi. I used, I used a lot of kimchi in my glass, right? So, I mean, most glasses, obviously, you're not doing that kind of production, 
but you know, because mine was dinner class, we used it in all kinds of bowls. I used it in stew, right? Making kimchi jjigae, kimchi pancakes, all different kinds of things with kimchi, right? So I use a, I could use a hundred pounds of kimchi in a quarter without any problem, right? And also when the garden is really rocking and rolling, you get fresh, fresh cucumbers right out of your garden. You can, you can easily pickle those using the same method, right? 2% brine for your, for your pickles. <clears throat> you can pickle almost anything, right? Chunks of kohlrabi. Wow, that's really, that makes a really great lacto-fermented pickle. Although I have to say it has a tendency to smell a little bit. Anything, um, anything in that, that mustard family or the, uh, it's in the same family with, uh, with radishes, right? Because of the sulfur compounds in them, right? They tend to they tend to smell a little bit eggy uh, when they get started, but man, they taste good afterwards. And then we had a couple people asking if you would share your own personal kimchi recipe. Sure, actually, I've got a I've got a copy of it. I'm pretty sure I've got a copy of it in my file. I can just uh, send that on. Yeah, okay. send, that, send that to me, and then anyone who would like that, just reach out to me at taste at nl.edu, and I can um, pass that on to you. So we got a few more questions, Chef. Yes. Um, is one dumpling shape better than another? No, I just like the, for, for this particular dumpling, I like this shape, right? For mandu, I like them, they look almost like a tortellini, right? So I actually really like that for this particular dumpling. Um, if I'm gonna do a fried dumpling though, if I was gonna fry these instead of boil them, which is what I'm gonna do, I would leave them, I would leave them untucked, right? And instead of just having a smooth top edge, I would probably pleat the edge. Now it takes some, it takes a little bit of uh, practice to get to pleat, you know, because you have to pleat one side only, right? Pleat one side to the other. And then when you're done, it has that nice fan shape, right? And they kind of curve a little bit. They're beautiful, but it takes a little practice to get there. Normally, I would I would fry a flatter dumpling, right? These because they're you know because they're very rounded. I don't think that they would fry particularly well. That having been said, I'm going to take this to the next step and put these in my boiling water bath over here. Okay. So now these are going to need to cook for a good five minutes. Okay, now we're actually kind of running out of time a little bit. But, uh, maybe if nobody minds, we could run over just a just a teeny. I, I think that I think these people are waiting for the payoff. Definitely. So, um, are there any sauces that you would recommend serving these with? Oh yes, I have them right here. <laughs> so, for this particular dumpling, I like to use a little mix of sesame oil, roasted sesame oil, or dark sesame oil, right? And oyster sauce, right? Now, it might sound like a, a bit of an odd combination, but it's delicious. Now, you can either dip with it, or I just prefer to actually toss the dumplings with, with this mix and then plate them and send them out, okay? But you got to remember that something that's really super salty or something that's really sour, um, maybe a bit much of a, uh, a combination, right? Because the combination, those flavors are very close, right? The kimchi's sour and it's salty. So something too salty or too sour might be a little odd. You know, you want to make a ponzu sauce, which is vinegar, soy sauce, maybe a little bit of uh, hot chili oil or chili, uh, chili paste, right? And some thin sliced scallions, it's great but it might not complement this particular dumpling that well, right? Sweet soy sauce, on the other hand, um, or ketchup manis, which you get from, from uh, Filipino groceries. You can pretty much get it at any uh, Chinese grocery. Uh, I think works really well with this. Uh, although it's really thick and you might wanna just thin it with a touch of water, that works really well too. <clears throat> um, or just, just plain old, <laughs> and again, this is one of those things where, because the kimchi is, is kind of spicy, right? I make my kimchi kind of hot, right? I like it that way. So if you don't want, if you don't want that complimentary heat, maybe just don't put the chili paste with it. I, on the other hand, right, like, 
chili garlic, uh, chili garlic oil, chili garlic paste, chili, chili garlic, pretty much anything, right? I get this particular one and I can't remember the brand name because I don't have it in front of me because I ran out. Um, I can't get back to Chinatown. Uh, it's oil, garlic, chilies, and fermented black beans, right? Oh man, it's good. Um, and that makes a great, uh, that makes a great, you know, just put some on top and then eat it because why not? Um, how okay. long, how long would these keep in the fridge and can you freeze them? Okay, keep them in the fridge. If you dust them well with cornstarch, you can keep them in the fridge for probably a day or two. But because the dough is going to continue to get a little softer, it relaxes, right? I was having a little problem with that one that I rolled like a couple hours ago, right? So you got to be careful, right? Dust them with cornstarch, they should be okay, right? So you could probably keep them because it's got raw pork in it, maybe a couple of days, but they freeze beautifully, right? Dust them with cornstarch, freeze them on a, on a pan where they're not sticking to each other, right? And then just transfer them to a container, put the lid on or put them in a Ziploc bag and, and just keep them in the freezer. You can keep them in there for a good six months, right? Pull them out on a rainy day, boil them up. And the other thing that, I mean, I didn't really mention I said, I like to make mine a little bit bigger. If you want to make your dumplings smaller, by all means, right? Use a half ounce of dough. I measure these out, weigh these out at one ounce, right? So that makes a pretty good size dumpling. You want to go half that size, right? Make little ones. You want to do them for, for a cocktail party, right? A dumpling this size is two bites, right? That's the biggest you're going to want to go for, you know, serving to your friends on a, at a cocktail party. Oh, here, have some dumplings, you know? This is something we just whipped up. You know, of course, maybe you made them a couple months ago and froze them, which is fine. You know, not a problem there. Um, but I'm going to mix up a little bit of a, a little bit of my magic elixir here. So I'm only going to do a half batch. So I usually do this is about two to one ratio. So I'll put a, I'll put two tablespoons of sesame, one tablespoon of oyster sauce. Okay. Oh yeah. Now I'm not, when I mix these together, I don't want it to be emulsified, okay? I'm gonna just break up the oyster sauce into very small particles, okay? So it's gonna coat the uh, dumplings nicely. Okay, so I don't know if you can really see this. You're not gonna be able to see that that it's tiny little particles, right? I don't think. Yeah, no. But in any case, it's not fully emulsified. I mean, that's not what I'm shooting for here. Okay. Yeah, let's have a look here. Ooh. I'm gonna give those about one more minute. Okay, I had one more question. Yeah, more questions, I'm good. Someone was asking, uh, do you think winter squash would work for a sweet dumpling? In the dough or inside? I would think inside. Well, you can use it, so you can make a dough using uh, using uh, vegetable puree like, uh, like winter squash, right? So it's like if you make a winter squash pasta or winter squash gnocchi, right? Something along those lines, you can do that. Um, if you want to put it inside, absolutely, right? So we were just talking, we talked a little bit about the, brec uh, the breakfast one, the dessert one, winter squash or sweet potato, either one works really good for that, right? Now, the thing about the winter squash though is you want to make sure that instead of steaming it, right, you're going to roast it because, again, you want to get as much of the, as much of the moisture out of it as you can. And then if you wanted to put some complimentary flavors in there for, uh, for the winter squash, roast the winter squash, some toasted sesame seeds, a touch of sesame oil, a little bit, right? A little sugar and a little salt. Oh yeah, right? That would make an absolutely terrific, terrific uh, dumpling, I think. Okay. So now, let's turn this off. Trying not to dump the hot water on myself. Okay.
And we're just gonna take these guys out kind of one by one here. I just, you don't want to dump this all over yourself or on your feet. So I'm just going to dump them in my little bit of oil here, flip them around, and then get them on my blade. Oh, yeah. So, Chef, um, yeah. The, the sauces for these dumplings, are they always prepared like that type of uh, viscosity and consistency? more of a, a liquid than a thick sauce? Yeah, it's a little bit easier to deal with if it's thin, I think. Um, so always, that's a big word. If you're using a paste though, if you're using like a chili paste, you know, you can do this um, something along those lines as well. And then I've got any extra sauce, I'm just gonna dump in my little bowl here. Get rid of my excess stuff. Oh, yeah. And so there is my kimchi mandu. Okay. You can get a better look here. Let me get a better look. All right. Awesome. Oh, right. yeah. Now I'm going to pop a cold one. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you always pair it with something. Um, yeah, I think it's good to have a tradition, have a beer with one. Yeah. With yeah. Now, well, if, uh, no place to be this afternoon. Yeah. If uh, these were fried, would you recommend a similar sauce for that or something a little bit different? If I was going to, if I was going to fry them, I would probably go with a different sauce. Because they're because they're boiled, they've got um, without the extra fat on the outside, right? Because when you're frying things, the extra fat wants to be balanced, right? So to balance that, a little bit of vinegar um, would be a good idea, I think. So I would go with a vinegar-based sauce, vinegar, soy, a little bit of chili, the scallion, right? So make a ponzu. Um, or you can use uh, lemon juice or yuzu, something along those lines, makes a really nice uh, makes a really nice sauce as well. Uh, so there's definitely a couple of different ways you can go about this, but I think for fried, I would definitely go with a with a vinegar-based sauce or something a little bit more sour. Okay. okay. Um, again, lots of thank you. So um, of course, thank you, chef. It's always Always a pleasure to be in your kitchen and see what you are creating. Um, also, folks, uh, one of the uh, participants in the meeting today did share with me a link that has a lot of different Asian markets that are in the area. And if anyone is interested in getting that information, please reach out to me at taste at nl.edu, and I will be more than happy to pass that information along to you. Um, Chef Quirk has also said he's going to get me his kimchi recipe. So if you would like to request that, reach out there. Any topics um, or anything you would like to communicate about the Taste Talks, we would love to hear it. Chef, anything else for us before we depart today? No, I just think it's, you know, it's great to watch these things, but, you know, get your hands in and try these things out. It's, it's not difficult, really. And if you're, you know, if it's just something you're playing with in your kitchen, no one's going to see it but you, right? Then by the time you've got it down, then you can, you can take it out to the wide world and everybody's going to be thinking you're, you know, a rocket scientist, which is great. Awesome. And also, I, I mentioned this in the, the last email I sent to everyone on the Taste Talks email list. I would love to see what you have all been creating in your kitchens or in your bars, um, what you have learned from the Taste Talks. And if you want to take some pictures and share it with us, we would really love to see that. Um, we might even think about starting our own social media channel and everything to share what people have been doing with the Taste Talks. So please send that my way. I want to see it. I love seeing people's pictures of their own creations. And I think that's it for today. So everyone okay. have an amazing Monday. And we will see you again. The next Taste Talk so is, is going to be on Thursday with our favorite Thirsty Thursday. And we have um, also on Friday, we will have a kombucha class. So it's going to be a fun week. All right.
Bye, everyone. Bye, and guys. Thank you again, Chef. Thank you, Beth. Okay.